let's start with this Lakers Grizzlies game that was really just a fascinating uh, blitzing by the Los Angeles Lakers in the opening quarter. And it didn't quite start that way. If yes, the Lakers went up 10 to two and they looked by far to be the more engaged team defensively, but it's worth noting here that again, we saw some struggles early on from the Lakers offense. They scored 10 points in the first five minutes. They probably had 10 points on something like their first 10 possessions of this game. It was not exactly a free flowing offensive environment for a number of ways, but then eventually for reasons that we'll talk about here momentarily after we introduce what happened here, we'll discuss how they changed that with a single set uh, that really changed the complexion of this game. Anthony Davis was the guy here. He dropped 31 points at 17 rebounds, completely dominated the game defensively on the interior. The Memphis Grizzlies shot 37.6% from the field in this game. If you go and actually uh, look at their two point percentage as well, it, it was not much better. They actually only shot 40.7% from two point range in this game. And I think that the biggest reason for that was Anthony Davis's consistency in terms of, of his rim protection, always being available from the weak side, uh, continually making life hard for Jaron Jackson, who uh, goes four for 12 in this game. Uh, a lot of his shots came on the interior. He turned it over six times as well. This is a very sloppy game from the Memphis Grizzlies in terms of the ball. They turned it over 18 times. This is a team that typically does not do that. Uh, it was an incredibly impressive performance, I thought, defensively from the Lakers. But I actually want to focus on the offense here, and I want to focus on some adjustments that Darvin Ham made throughout the course of the first quarter that ultimately got the Lakers the victory here. And this Lakers coaching staff is one that I've had a lot of questions about in terms of rotations, in terms of the way that they tend to go about attacking their opponent. Uh, in terms of not having enough size out there, in terms of not having enough speed and skill out there, I thought that. What Darvin Ham did after those first five minutes of this first quarter was really, really impressive. And I think we have to go back and start with game two in the first quarter to understand some of the issues that occurred uh, throughout these first quarters for the Lakers. So we're going to pull up some clips here as I'm talking through them and we're going to just kind of dive in here. So as you'll see throughout the course of these clips, the biggest number one overarching thing that I want you to take a look at is the way that the Memphis Grizzlies are going to help off of Jared Vanderbilt's man almost every single time. A lot of the time that man is Jaron Jackson. A lot of the time that player is Santi Aldama. But at the end of the day, the end result is the same. They're helping off. They're crowding the paint. They're making it much more difficult for the Lakers to be able to actually get into their sets and do what they want to do. So here you're going to see LeBron. He's taking on Dylan Brooks. He's trying to, he has like an empty side of the court here. And Jared Vanderbilt is going to go to the corner here. There's just no real concern here from Xavier Tillman that Jared Vanderbilt is going to the corner. He takes a little peek here momentarily, as you'll see right here to check where uh, his man is. That's Jared Vanderbilt leaking out to the corner. But ultimately, he sees LeBron driving, does not care, and he's just going to crowd the paint, right? There are three men in the paint there. Ultimately, LeBron is a stud. He gets the offensive rebound. But this is what the Grizzlies did in game two of this series. They crowded the paint constantly. You're going to see here D'Angelo Russell rejects a screen. Jared Vanderbilt is in that corner on the cross side of the court. And this is just an easy rotation for Jaron Jackson. It's going to result, uh, the worst case scenario, in a kickout from D'Angelo Russell to a player that the Grizzlies are more than happy to see shoot the basketball. But look, this is just a simple rotation here from Jaron Jackson. Double team. D'Angelo probably does need to make that cross corner kick out. Jared has to get it up to Austin Reeves on the wing. You have to make the Grizzlies X out and make sure that they're solid in their rotation. But instead, D'Angelo Russell takes this terrible shot. And again, you see the way that the Grizzlies played this in the first quarter of this game in game two. Again here, D'Angelo Russell going to take an empty side ball screen here. 
Again, Santi Aldama is the player guarding Jared Vanderbilt in this set. Xavier Tillman knows that he has the help on the backside from Santi Aldama. He is able to stay home while also playing in the gap against Anthony Davis. Santi rotates all the way in to just be that impediment in the interior for when D'Angelo Russell is going to drive. Results in a turnover because Jared Vanderbilt ends up sinking a little bit too deep into that dunker spot area. D'Angelo Russell tries to hit the kick out. Steal from Tyus Jones goes the other way. Now we're going to see D'Angelo Russell bring this ball up again. Jared Vanderbilt is going to go to the corner. Stays up at the wing actually this time. I'm sorry. High ball screen from Anthony Davis. We're going to see him rotate it over. Post up for Anthony Davis. Again, Santi Aldama is here. He is on the weak side. He is guarding Jared Vanderbilt. The Grizzlies just are not concerned about Vanderbilt, especially when LeBron sinks to the corner and they have an easy tag here uh, and they have an easy help rotation down with Jared Vanderbilt. Again, Santi Aldama rotates over multiple guys in the paint. Just a very easy, easy play. And then finally here, this is the last clip, I believe. We're going to go through. Austin Reeves is going to come up. He's going to take a ball screen. He's going to take it from Anthony Davis here. Again, significant rotation from Jared, Jaron Jackson coming over because they are not concerned about what Jared Vanderbilt is doing. Uh, this is some spread action where they have Jared Vanderbilt in the corner constantly. And because Jared Vanderbilt is not a shooter, it just completely and utterly breaks everything down. They do hit the shooter there, but that's a shot that Memphis is more than happy with, right? Okay, so we're going to remove this from the stream, and now we're going to go to what happened in game three here. In game three, the offense did not start incredibly well for the Los Angeles Lakers here. Uh, again, they only had... 10 points in the first five minutes of this game. And what you're going to see is a very smart adjustment from Darvin Ham, from this staff. Instead of trying to continue along the road of running these spread high ball screens, maybe have a single high ball screen on the wing to try and get their players into the middle of the court, they're going to start setting double drag actions. And they ran this play basically for five consecutive minutes in the first quarter and just completely destroyed the Grizzlies here, as you're going to see. So Austin Reeves is going to come up. It's going to set the screen. And this is a double drag where Reeves is going to stay on the wing. Anthony Davis is going to roll all the way to the basket. And the thing that you're going to consistently notice here is that Anthony Davis is going to get behind Xavier Tillman and because it's an empty side of the court in terms of where the help should come from from the corner, there is not a low man to tag on Anthony Davis, which means Xavier Tillman has to stay somewhat at home here. Now, Santi Aldama actually makes a mistake here in the right corner defensively, left corner offensively. He needs to just really sink in here and really just make D'Angelo Russell hit that corner kick out to Jared Vanderbilt. He's a little bit late on that same side rotation. And because of it, D'Angelo Russell gets an easy bucket. Okay. Second play here. Literally the next time down the court, as you'll see, 13 seconds later. Reeves comes up, sets the first in the double drag. Just a very quick slip before D'Angelo Russell even gets to the second screen in this action. Immediately, Austin Reeves in the paint, hits that cross corner kick out. Quick rotation up to the wing, quick rotation back down. Jared Vanderbilt, again, not a shooter. He misses the shot, but Reeves is there. Offensive rebound. They're a little bit confused in terms of picking up their men. Okay. Here we go again. Same play again, opposite side of the court. D'Angelo Russell comes. Rui Achimura hits this corner or hits this wing three. Again, same play here. Dennis Schroeder, opposite side of the court again from where we started. Schroeder's going to miss this layup. Uh, attempted put back again from Anthony Davis, but you will see that they just did not have an answer for this because they couldn't figure out 
who was supposed to help from the low side of the court. Again, as we saw in game two, the Grizzlies are relying on heavy help at the basket from guys like Santi Aldama, Jaron Jackson Jr. in order to try and slow down the dribble penetration from the Los Angeles Lakers. Here we're going to go again. Austin Reeves going to go up, set the first part. Anthony Davis sets a bit of a slip screen, not quite a ghost screen, gets behind Xavier Tillman here. Just a very quick uh, offensive rebound because Anthony Davis is in position because he got behind Xavier Tillman, gets this rebound, goes back up, thunderous dunk. Again, same set, same action. This time it is a bit of a ghost screen from Anthony Davis. D'Angelo Russell throws it up, easy bucket. And again, this one around the six-minute mark, Austin Reeves sets the first screen. Anthony Davis sets the second screen. This time you get a cut from the slot from LeBron James. You'll notice again, after those first two sets that the Lakers run with this action, where Jared Vanderbilt was the player in the corner, a smart adjustment from Darvin Ham takes Jared Vanderbilt off of the court, even though John ja Morant is still on the court. And what the reaction here is, is that Luke Kennard cannot leave that opposite corner. John ja Morant has to like kind of tag from uh, the high man, basically here. He is the low man on the opposite side, even though he's the lone man on the opposite side. Again, slot cut here, LeBron James, downhill freight train going to the basket. This is how the Lakers ultimately won this game. If you go through everything that we saw in this game, outside of this little run here in the first quarter where the Lakers were up 35 to nine at the end of the first quarter, the Grizzlies outplayed them in the third quarter and the fourth quarter. You can say that the Lakers took their foot off the gas. I think I would agree defensively. You can say that John Morant was absolutely heroic in the fourth quarter, and he was. Uh, John Morant finishes this game with 45 points and 13 assists on 26 shots, 14 free throws. He made 13 of those free throws. John Morant was unconscious in the fourth quarter, and he is the reason that this game ended up being at least somewhat competitive in the fourth quarter. But the reason the Lakers won this game is that little seven-minute stretch in the first quarter where they continued to run this double drag action and the Grizzlies had absolutely no answer because they couldn't figure out who needed to help, who needed to uh, be that low man to try and get Anthony Davis out of rolling position and how to essentially stop the dribble penetration of D'Angelo Russell and Dennis Schroeder at times. So the Lakers win this game. They're up two to one. They have home court advantage at this point in the series. I picked the Lakers to win this series coming into it because I just kind of thought that their depth and their size and Anthony Davis's defensive ability at this stage, uh, I think has been really remarkable over the course uh, of this season when he has played. Uh, also thought that we'd see more from LeBron James. We haven't really seen LeBron James get out of second gear, it feels like, in this series. I know that he had 25 points, nine rebounds, five assists in this game, but there wasn't ever a point where it felt like he was dominating this game. It was a quiet 25, nine and four, which is the crazy thing. The guy that stood out a ton to me again was Rui Achimura. He gets that technical foul. I thought it was so indicative of his game today. People in Washington, you know, I've talked about this on the podcast before with Fred Katz when he was been, when he was on the show, he covered Rui in Washington. One of the things about Rui was, they really had to push him to bring him out of his shell in terms of aggressiveness. They would really try and like, especially Russell Westbrook would try and like get at him and try to like give him a quick little like shove, like, Hey, let's get going. Let's get energetic. Let's get aggressive because the, everyone knows the tools that Rui has. Rui six foot nine, very fluid athletically can get downhill in transition, has that very high release point on the mid range shot can be a mismatch nightmare when he wants to be. But throughout the course of his career, he hasn't been aggressive enough trying to get to the basket, try to get downhill. He gets that technical foul because he feels that little shove from either David Roddy or John Concher uh, after the play was over. 
I think the Lakers will be ecstatic with that technical foul, if I'm being honest. It came at a weird time, and it feels like the Grizzlies after that went on a bit of a run. The Lakers win this game, but an aggressive Rui Achimura is the thing that the Lakers hoped for when they traded for him. It's the thing that they really desperately wanted to try and get out of him. Uh, I'm sure that it's a part of their scouting process, was trying to figure out, hey, we have the right mix of guys. We have the right mentality to where we can get the most out of this guy uh, when he plays on the court for us. And so far in the playoffs, this is a very advantageous matchup for Rui. Uh, he is playing a Memphis Grizzlies team where there are a number of potential mismatches out on the court for him to try and attack. Luke Kennard, uh, you know, Tyus Jones, John Morant in two of the games that he has played. These guys are a little too small for Rui. Uh, even someone like David Roddy, isn't quite big enough or long enough to be able to really impact and affect the shot. He can stop him from getting to the basket because of his strength, but he can kind of just shoot over David Roddy. So I don't know if this will continue if the Lakers are to move on to play Sacramento, a team with a little bit more size, guys like Keegan Murray that they can match up with him, ties uh, Trey Lyles off the bench uh, who can match up with Rui a little bit better. And if it's the Warriors, they have a number of guys they can throw uh, in terms of athletic and size uh, at Rui Achimura to be able to slow him down. But the Grizzlies don't really have that. And it's great to see Rui take advantage of that over the course of this series. And it's really been a breakout for him. This is an incredibly important series. Rui Achimura hits free agency this offseason. And undeniably, he's made himself money in this playoff series, because one of the big questions about Rui coming into the playoffs was how will he perform? He does not necessarily have the kind of game that you would think translates toward playing well with stars, but you know, I think so far in these three games that we've seen him coming off the bench, being that kind of sixth man shot creator is a really ideal role for him. Uh, in games like this, in playoff settings. And if he has it going in terms of the jumper, he can be impactful, even though his off-ball defense can sometimes be a little bit of a mess. I think it's been really good so far in the playoffs. The fact that, again, he's active, he's aggressive, he's engaged. This Lakers coaching staff has done a really, really good job getting the most out of Rui Achimura. Uh, a couple of questions here from B in the YouTube comments here. Do I think Austin Reeves will get an offer sheet? I do. I think he's worth more than what the Lakers can offer him. It will be interesting to see if anybody tries to go down that road. Uh, and then the second question from B here is what does Rui's money look like? I think he's a really fascinating one because before this playoff run, I would have told you that I thought he was somewhere below the mid-level and I thought that he would be asking for more than the mid-level. And I don't really know how to square that circle necessarily. Now, with how he's playing in the playoffs, if this continues and continues to go down the road of him being an impact player for the Lakers, if they get out of this series, if they go on and play the Kings or the Warriors, he could really be someone that a team sees as an upside swing, given his physical tools that everyone has always known. It's just never been necessarily uh a circumstance that we've seen consistently from Rui. Uh, and then finally here, uh, in terms of Memphis ag adjustments from uh, Zvonimir Bercalo, he asks, should Memphis try some Zaire Williams and Jake LaRavia? I think Jake LaRavia has like a calf injury right now, and I don't know that he is an option for Memphis. But Zaire Williams, I think, would be an interesting adjustment just because we saw him at the point of attack at times last year in the playoffs. Now, the thing is that the Lakers don't really have that guy that you have to guard a bigger, longer athletic player at the point of attack with. But I would be intrigued just to see if he can give anything at the very least defensively for Memphis. Again, it feels like Memphis hasn't had problems defensively, but I'd just be trying to find a lot of different answers and trying to find a lot of different things to throw at the Lakers because I think the Lakers, just given the lack of depth that Memphis has without Steven Adams, without Brandon Clark, uh, last game without John Morant, it is difficult, I think, for them to match up uh, when the Lakers adjust. They just don't have as many answers 
uh, for opposing teams because their depth is hindered right now by the injuries. The last question here by Andrew Kolb. Thoughts on Dylan Brooks? He seems to shoot the Grizzlies out of a lot of playoff games. I would be looking to move on from Dylan Brooks in the offseason. He's an uh, unrestricted free agent. I get that he has probably played a very real role in terms of building this toughness culture that the Grizzlies really value, this competitiveness that they really value in guys that they select. Think guys like Desmond Bain. Jake LaRavia fits this mold. David Roddy fits this mold. Uh, certainly Jaron Jackson and John Morant fit this mold. Uh, I just think that it's really hard to live when you have this guy that's taking these terribly inefficient shots and continuing to make these kind of boneheaded decisions. I think that the Grizzlies will be in the market as well this offseason for a potential star wing. Uh, and we'll maybe talk about one later in the show that I would be going all out for if I was Memphis.